My name is Chris Newton Che. I'm a heart failure transplant cardiologist at Mass General, uh, an associate member here at the Broad, and I study the genetic basis of complex cardiovascular traits. Uh, today's session is going to focus on pharmacogenomics. I thought we'd take a just a brief review of what we've covered so far. Uh, so far in the primer series, uh, Mark Daly has covered complex trait genetics and Jim Gisela Mendelian genetics. Uh, Alyssa Manning has talked about common variant analysis, and uh, Geraldine van der Auer has talked about sequencing and variant calling, Caitlin Samocha, rare variant analysis. Um, and then we've done a series on uh, different ways of annotating genetic variation. Steve Schaffner spoke about selection, Shamil Sanyayev about protein coding variation, and Manolis Kellis about non-coding variation. Um, uh, Sarah Calvo uh, talked about mitochondrial genomics, and uh, upcoming talks include Bob Hansiger's talk on structural variation, Gaddy Getz will talk about somatic mutation and cancer genomics, Jordan Smaller will talk about the importance of phenotype definition in genetic discovery, Feng Zhang will talk about genome editing uh, at a basic level, and uh, Romnick Xavier will talk about uh, the microbiome. Feel free to send suggestions for additional talks. We do have uh, a few slots still open uh, toward the end uh, in February um, and we could potentially run to March. Uh, so feel free to shoot me an email if there's someone uh, or a subject you'd like to hear discovered. Uh, this is a cathode ray tube. It used to be what people would watch television on. It doesn't have a remote. Uh, and uh, I realize with millennials, none of you have really seen this except in your parents' pictures. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, pharmacogenomics in general. We'll talk about uh, general principles uh, and some examples of the genetic basis of uh, pharma pharmacologic efficacy, pharmacologic toxicity, and then a few specific uh, studies that we're doing on cardiotoxic uh, drug response. Pharmacogenetics is the study of genetic variation influencing variable therapeutic or toxic responses to drugs. Uh, its potential uses could include individualized prescription to enhance efficacy and reduce toxicity, to predict outcomes, and to improve our understanding of the uh, physiologic basis of drug response. Personalized medicine uh, entails the attempt to go beyond clinical trials which typically study differences of means and groups exposed to one intervention or, or not. Patients, of course, do not experience uh, mean event rates, but they experience individual outcomes. It's a zero-one proposition for your patients. Uh, they will or will not have a heart attack, uh, and, um, and that leads to efforts to try to personalize uh, the approach. Um, Personalized medicine has been invoked to allow us to identify the right drug in the right patient and at the right time, and there's an ongoing precision medicine initiative uh, that is focused on such an approach. This is not new. Uh, the Framingham Risk Score is one example of an attempt to uh, personalize uh, decisions about prevention of uh, myocardial infarction with use of statins. Uh, incorporating clinical factors such as age, gender, cholesterol, uh, blood pressure. I, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm about the potential role of genetics to uh, improve our ability to use clinical tools uh, and identify individuals at risk of adverse outcomes. DNA is destiny is a bit of a, um, a trope uh, uh, currently. I would say it's important to uh, communicate to the lay public that DNA is not destiny, that there's nothing magical about genetic variation or a genetic sequence. Just because it's permanent doesn't mean it's deterministic, and I think uh, that gets confused a lot. In fact, medicine cannot predict the future. It cannot tell an individual patient that she will or will not have a side effect or a po positive response to a drug. Humans live in complex environments in a diversity of exposures, and there's a diversity of genetic variation. And I think it's important for our community to talk responsibly about what the promise of genetics uh, holds. Medicine deals in probabilities, 
and pharmacogenomics and personalized or precision medicine seeks to better estimate probabilities of positive responses and probabilities of adverse responses. I think it's much more appropriate for us to speak uh, more like gamblers than uh, people gazing into a crystal ball. Adverse drug reactions are common. Uh, it's estimated that there are uh, millions of adverse drug reactions annually and uh, on the order of 100,000 deaths per year due to adverse drug reactions um, uh, based on uh, different estimates. So there's a lot of focus on trying to understand the physiologic determinants of drug response. And these are uh, commonly bundled into uh, pharmacokinetic uh, components in ADME, uh, which represents the uh, mechanisms that contribute to the absorption of drug, the distribution of drug in various tissues, the metabolism or clearance of the drug, and excretion or elimination from the body. Uh, these collectively are called pharmacokinetics. And then there's the focus on the target receptor, which is, uh, is certainly the most easy to understand for uh, uh, folks who are not uh, in, the, in the pharma uh, business, and these involve pharmacodynamics. Uh, these are specifically studying the mechanisms that influence the, the precise target. And the target may, uh, may be a protein, it may be a protein that has to get to a membrane, so there are a bunch of features that contribute to that uh, target physiology. So I'm going to give some examples of studies of the efficacy of drugs, and then I'll talk a little bit about the toxicity of drugs, so you can think about both. Both have genetic determinants, and some of the challenges in uh, these studies. Uh, here are the four examples that I'll give. I'll talk a bit about somatic mutation uh, in the form of two uh, cancer therapeutics, uh, and then response to uh, a uh, treatment for an infectious agent, and then a complex trait, uh, specifically talking about myocardial infarction. So BCR ABLE is a, the Philadelphia chromosome involves uh, the translocation uh, from uh, chromosome 9 and, uh, and uh, uh, two positions on chromosome 9 and 22, which when uh, uh, brought together uh, as a somatic mutation uh, cause dramatically increased risk of uh, various hematologic cancers, including specifically 95% of chronic myelogenous leukemia. This leads to constitutively active, as opposed to uh, inducible, tyrosine kinase activity and uh, a specific targeted therapy, imatinib, developed specifically to competitively bind to the ATP binding site uh, as a function of rational drug design is dramatically uh, therapeutic for uh, treating patients with chronic myelogenous uh, leukemia. So it's a great example of the success of pharmacogenetics, in this case recognizing the role that a somatic mutation plays in uh, disease pathogenesis. Here you can see the white blood cell count uh, in a trial. Uh, the normal range of white blood cell count is, uh, is about uh, 5,000 to 10,000 uh, white blood cells uh, per uh, cubic millimeter. And here you can see in the leukemic range, uh, anything from 10,000 to 100,000. These are where patients start out with uh, CML. And you can see that within days, treatment with uh, Gleevec uh, leads to a, a dramatic, or imatinib, a dramatic reduction in uh, white blood cell count. And this is really identifying the Achilles heel of specific cancers uh, that have key drivers. And Gaddy Getz will talk in much greater detail about uh, somatic mutation. I think oncology really is in the vanguard of uh, personalized medicine because of several key features, and it's important to recognize the difference between somatic uh, genetic variation and germline variation. Um, many opportunities that are available for oncologic discovery uh, include the availability of tumor, the ability to make uh, tumor to germline comparisons uh, based on studying both diseased and uh, non-diseased tissue, including uh, blood. Uh, this has led to a molecular understanding of, the, of tumor pathogenesis and the sequential steps that are required uh, because of serial sampling. In fact, uh, uh, because tumor gets removed, it's readily available for study as opposed to, say, myocardial infarction, which results in coronary arteries. We do not routinely remove coronary arteries to enable 
uh, understanding of the pathogenesis in humans. And, and this has really led to targeted molecular therapeutics, um, and that's why oncology is an early priority for uh, uh, President Obama's personalized medicine initiative. Another example of uh, recognizing these Achilles heel, Achilles heel uh, mutations uh, was a study of uh, EGFR uh, mutations, the uh, epidermal growth factor receptor. Um, these are overexpressed in 40 to 80 percent of non-small cell lung cancer, and it was thought that it was an obvious target. So uh, gefitinib, or ERESA, was developed um, but unfortunately failed in its initial uh, clinical trial because there was a response in only 10 to 20 percent of patients with non-small cell lung cancer, although that small subset uh, tended to have a dramatic response. And so in a follow-up study examining uh, 25 patients who had a partial response, who had uh, somatic tumor uh, tissue available, uh, there, it was identified that there were uh, nine samples that uh, could be screened for EGFR mutations. And in fact, eight out of those nine samples uh, had EGFR mutations and had subsequently been validated in multiple independent experiments. Um, these mutations were typically localized to the tyrosine kinase domains of EGFR. Um, and uh, in broadening the study to include the full 25, who had tumor available, it was identified that um, uh, among those who had EGFR uh, mutations, uh, non-response uh, was relatively low. Uh, other targeted cancer therapeutics uh, that folks may be aware of, uh, either due to uh, personal or professional experience, include uh, the HER2 uh, or new receptor positive breast cancers that are specifically targeted with uh, medications like trastuzumab or uh, follow-on therapies. Um, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation uh, carriage, which is in fact uh, a germline uh, mutation that leads to loss of heterozygosity and uh, risk of uh, breast and ovarian cancer, uh, has, uh, has uh, both been used for identifying patients who need intensive surveillance, but also uh, patients who may opt to have uh, prophylactic or preventive uh, removal of the tissues at risk, such as a mastectomy or removal of the ovaries. All right. Um, another example uh, is a therapy for hepatitis C. Uh, uh, hepatitis C worldwide is uh, quite common. Estimates of seroprevalence are on the order of 1 to 2 percent of the general population, and it leads, it's a major cause of cirrhosis and hepatocellular or liver carcinoma worldwide. Uh, there was a study done of uh, pegylated interferon and ribavirin, a uh, somewhat toxic uh, drug regimen, uh, which people would take for 48 weeks. Everybody pr feels like they have influenza uh, when they take the therapy. Uh, it was focused on the most common uh, genotype of the hepatitis C virus. And in doing a genome-wide association study, it identified a single polymorphism that was associated with sustained virologic response, uh, despite having a baseline higher viral load. So individuals with this genotype were at greater uh, at risk of a greater burden of hepatitis C, but they also ha enjoyed a greater benefit from uh, this targeted therapy. Uh, in fact, the initial polymorphism was highly correlated with an amino acid altering polymorphism in the IL-28B receptor, uh, which encodes the interferon gamma-3 uh, gene. And if you look at these, uh, these are sustained virologic responses. That means clearance or eradication of hepatitis C from the bloodstream, uh, which is a good marker of uh, hepatitis C uh, uh, reservoirs in the liver, shows dramatic genotype differences. If you look at, uh, these are among uh, European Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, uh, considered in ancestry specific uh, analyses, and you can see that uh, those who have two copies of the lucky C genotype, unlucky in that if they don't receive treatment, uh, they have higher viral loads, but lucky that when they do receive treatment, uh, they have much greater uh, sustained virologic responses, uh, roughly, um, 80% uh, versus 30% uh, in the low group. Uh, you can see again in African Americans, while the 
um, uh, overall responses uh, are lower. Uh, there's still a dramatic effect across these genotype groups and the same among Hispanics, uh, such that in the combined group there's overwhelming evidence of uh, a strong uh, genetic ef effect uh, on response. And if you look at the race-specific response rates, in fact, the frequency of uh, the beneficial sensitizing allele, the C uh, allele, is much lower in African Americans and much higher in East Asians, intermediate in European Americans and Hispanics, which uh, are often European Americans. Um, and you can see that the proportion who have a sustained virologic response is highly correlated to the frequency of this uh, C allele. So in fact, this genetic variant alone explains a lot of the racial difference in response to therapy. Uh, this, the association of this polymorphism uh, has been replicated in multiple studies. It's also associated with spontaneous clearance of hepatitis C. So uh, while it sensitizes to higher levels of, uh, of viral load, uh, it also marks people who are more likely to clear it through endogenous mechanisms, uh, of which one is the admini exogenous administration of this interferon-based therapy. So a corollary to this study is that the genetic effects on disease risk are really high priority candidates to test for modulation of drug response, meaning studying genetic variants that are related to disease risk and identifying such variants uh, pr helps prioritize those variants to study whether um, uh, they may modulate response to drugs, even if we don't know what the exact mechanism is. And in fact, uh, many of you will have heard of these budget-busting hepatitis C uh, targeted uh, antiviral therapies that are highly active. Uh, in fact, these, uh, there are now multiple highly active antiviral therapies for hepatitis C that have clearance rates of 95%, uh, meaning that all this exciting genetic study that I just showed you is now no longer relevant because, in fact, uh, the uh, crude interferon ribavirin therapy is blown out of the water by uh, subsequent therapies. And this is a general theme that I'll come back to, which is that, in fact, uh, our use of, uh, of therapies uh, changes over time. So while penicillin uh, one of the original drugs uh, first developed uh, 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 kind of beyond the snake oil era of, uh, of medicine, uh, or at least Western medicine, uh, is still used. Most therapies are ultimately supplanted by uh, therapies that work much better as we come to understand how they act. And so one of the challenges of doing pharmacogenetic studies is uh, that we're constantly abandoning older therapies and acquiring newer therapies. And this requires having some infrastructure to efficiently identify these uh, pharmacogenetic effects, or they'll never really be uh, very relevant because uh, we're constantly playing catch up. And I'll, I'll touch back uh, on this later. Um, another example uh, relates to the use of clopidogrel, which is an antiplatelet uh, agent. It leads, it's like an aspirin that leads to platelet disaggregation. Platelets uh, have a tendency to become sticky and clump together at sites of bleeding, uh, activated by exposure of tissue factor. And um, the irritation caused by putting a stent to open up a blocked artery uh, often activates tissue factor and can lead to uh, acute thrombosis. So in fact, we give antiplatelet agents like clopidogrel in addition to aspirin uh, in order to reduce that risk. Uh, this uh, is actually delivered as a prodrug. It has to be converted to an active metabolite by uh, a cytochrome P450 uh, enzyme. Uh, the cytochrome uh, P450 enzymes are actually an entire family of diverse enzymes that have evolved over time to allow us to deal with uh, nutritional, uh, a diversity of nutritional toxic exposures. Uh, so if you imagine, in human history or in the history of our uh, ancestors uh, foraging for food and finding new foods, uh, one needed a repertoire of, uh, of enzymes uh, to allow the breakdown of different potentially toxic uh, uh, agents. Well, drug development um, or drugs that we've developed uh, that humans may never have seen uh, often are targeted by these enzymes because they're very uh, 
uh, promiscuous and uh, we've evolved to have a, a healthy repertoire uh, able to deal with drugs that we've never seen. Um, so the, uh, there was a genome-wide association study in uh, a group of healthy individuals who uh, had been studied for both their uh, clopidogrel metabolite levels, the active agents in plasma, uh, and um, uh, cytochrome P450 2C19 genotype was associated with uh, reduced clopidogrel metabolite in the plasma, which translated to a diminished reduction in platelet aggregation. This was in healthy individuals, but in fact, this translates into clinical events such that the risk of acute thrombosis or platelet plugs that uh, plug up the stents that are deployed uh, uh, are influenced by this failure to produce uh, active drug and risk of myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiovascular death are also increased uh, because these uh, antiplatelet agents also uh, reduce um, uh, thrombotic events in other coronary arteries, not just where the stents go. So the FDA in uh, March of 2010, after these data uh, came out, uh, they got a lot of press. It was exciting because cardiovascular disease is common, stent use is common, clopidogrel use is common. Uh, so the FDA issued another black box warning. In fact, 10% of all drugs that are currently on the market have a black box warning uh, or a labeled pharmacogenetic interaction, even though most of you will be unfamiliar with any of your specific genetic profiles that might influence your response to drugs. So there's a bit of a gap. We have a regulatory agency that is uh, reading these uh, studies and um, I think is excited about the potential to recognize uh, interactions, but there's a bit of a translational gap, whereas, uh, in fact, uh, when this black box warning came out, there was no currently marketed uh, test to measure genotype. Uh, in fact, this genotype would have to be measured in the emergency room if you're having a heart attack and you're on your way to the cath lab and you need to get there in 60 minutes so they can put in the stent and you need to get an antiplatelet agent. Uh, on board, you can appreciate that's a bit of a precious uh, moment, and unless you can interpose a genetic test in that uh, very narrow uh, window to influence your approach, then in fact it's quite challenging. This has motivated other approaches such as preemptive genetic testing, and there are studies, uh, Dan Roden in the uh, Emerge Network at Vanderbilt has been an advocate for preemptive genetic testing where you essentially do a genome-wide panel of genetic variants that have been shown to influence a variety of different drug responses, and then it's part of your profile. Uh, all it would require is accessing your genetic information in a timely way. So if we were all genotyped before we had our heart attack, uh, maybe years before, because DNA is durable, uh, then when we showed up for our heart attack, they could look up our uh, predicted genetic response. and dial in the appropriate drug. This is a, uh, uh, an idea, it, it requires a lot of, uh, of testing, and you can imagine for the majority of people who uh, in fact take very few drugs, who are healthy, uh, this might be of relatively limited utility uh, or might um, uh, be supplanted uh, ultimately. So when you deploy such preemptive approaches, uh, I think remains to be decided. Um, CYP2C9 trials of point of care testing, uh, that is uh, little handheld units that could be tested in the urgent clinical environment uh, are uh, under review. Uh, there are alternative drugs uh, that do not require the same activating enzyme uh, uh, effect, but clopidogrel is generic and after the um, drug companies finished uh, beating up the generic makers. In fact, now it's cheaper to get uh, clopidogrel. Uh, this is a big business uh, and uh, expensive, and these are life-saving life therapies. In fact, uh, prazogrel and ticagrelor have not had great uh, uh, adoption, largely because of the uh, uncertainty about the relative balance between uh, the impact on efficacy and the cost. Uh, so clopidogrel remains standard of care for now, uh, although uh, there are various high-risk uh, individuals who might get uh, these other agents. Is there a question? Should this be 2C19? Uh, I put the wrong one. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's substitution 19. <coughs> Thanks. It's a typo. <coughs> okay. So uh, I think I've highlighted for you several examples of uh, both somatic mutation targets, uh, targets of, uh, of drug response, uh, in fact, in the um, same pathway as the, the primary drug, and uh, of relatively complex traits, but in this case, the activating enzyme, very proximate to the uh, function of a drug. Uh, obviously, some of the excretion or uh, metabolizing uh, enzymes, unless they have a very strong effect on drug uh, uh, distribution uh, or pharmacokinetics, may have relatively modest effects, but this is a relatively uh, strong effect. There's another example uh, that I've included in uh, recent talks. Uh, in fact, it was a study of, uh, of lithium in uh, bipolar disorder. Uh, it, was a, it was a bit remarkable in the sense that uh, lithium response uh, to, uh, uh, as manifest by uh, a score of how much bipolar disorder is under control. It's a, bipolar disorder is a combination of depression and uh, mania, which exist in, uh, at separate times, potentially. Um, but it's a bit of a challenging uh, phenotype. Uh, they demonstrated an unbelievable uh, uh, genetic effect um, uh, that was replicated in their study and that showed highly uh, sensitive and specific uh, predictions of uh, drug response. In fact, this has not been replicated in other studies, and so it is unbelievable so far, uh, uh, barring uh, independent replication. And uh, I think sometimes you should uh, recognize that sometimes it is too good to be true. Okay, so I'll give some examples of uh, toxicity, uh, where pharmacogenetic effects uh, can lead to adverse drug uh, responses uh, through uh, examples related to uh, cancer therapy, cardiovascular therapy, uh, HIV therapy, and treatments for uh, thrombotic disorders. So one example is uh, TPMT, or thiopurine methyltransferase, uh, which is involved in the S-methylation of uh, drugs, which inactivates mercaptopurine, azathioprine, and thioguanine. These are immune suppressants uh, that reduce immune activity. Uh, they uh, can be crudely recognized uh, by their effect on reducing white blood cell counts, which uh, is a general marker of ability to fight infection. Um, there are uh, polymorphisms that were recognized way before we had uh, a human genome sequence uh, uh, reference draft um, that have high activity. 90% of people have the high activity uh, allele in the homozygous state. 10% are uh, have intermediate activity. These are typically heterozygous for uh, uh, one of a few uh, uh, hypofunctional enzymes, and then 0.3% uh, of the population is homozygous for the low activity allele. And these people uh, have very impaired uh, ability to inactivate these immune suppressants. So you can imagine if 90% of people are very, uh, are, are uh, efficiently able to inactivate this immune suppressant, then you would generally target a dose uh, for most people uh, that might be quite toxic to a small subset. And in fact, uh, TPMT genotyping is uh, established for uh, uh, oncologic agents that target these. Um, you can see here uh, the uh, systemic exposure uh, for fixed dosing by genotype such that the wild type, the 90% of people who have the common genotype, have a relatively low uh, exposure. This is on a uh, arithmetic, not logarithmic scale. Uh, but you can see there's a substantial increase in the exposure for homozygotes who have the uh, deficient enzyme uh, responsiveness. And you can see thus that the cumulative incidence of uh, toxicity for this 0.3% of people is uh, as high as 100%, that uh, if you don't dose adjust or recognize this up front, uh, you will poison the people who are getting these therapies. And so in fact, TPMT genotyping is typical. Uh, childhood uh, acute leukemia uh, that are uh, targeted with mercaptopurine type uh, therapies uh, include genotype-based dosing. Uh, this is in fact not currently routinely used in azathioprine dosing. 
Uh, although this is chronically used in the transplant setting, I have many patients who take uh, azathioprine and we're, we're uh, due to um, incomplete data on the importance of this uh, drug uh, metabolizing enzyme, uh, we watch for low white blood cell count and then dose adjust uh, rather than uh, use genotype uh, based targeting. However, we're giving doses that are much more modest uh, for chronic immune suppression relative to the treatment of an acute leukemia where there's an explosion of white blood cells in the bloodstream. Uh, there was a uh, genome-wide association study done on uh, statins. Uh, statins antagonize the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme and lead to upregulation in the liver of LDL receptors, which causes cholesterol to be uh, 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 removed uh, from the, uh, the bloodstream uh, or less production of uh, LDL cholesterol. Um, Statins are widely used to reduce the risk of heart attack in patients who've had heart attack or who are at high risk. Um, but one of the common uh, or not uncommon toxicities is uh, statin-induced muscle intolerance. And there is muscle ache. Uh, this is what's most common. Uh, but an extreme form of it involves muscle damage or injury that's reflected by uh, seeing high end, uh, uh, elevations in the bloodstream of creatine phosphokinase, which is released from damaged muscle. So there was a comparatively small uh, study. Again, your little spidey sense should say, beware of large effects uh, when you're doing small studies. You would want to see some replication. Uh, a comparatively small study of, uh, uh, not surprisingly, a number that's close to the 96 well plate format uh, that many of us use in our genotyping arrays. Uh, clearly, they had some uh, uh, controls on the plates um, and found that by comparing 85 cases to 90 controls uh, where cases had uh, tenfold elevation in these, heart, uh, in these uh, skeletal muscle enzymes uh, or uh, a, a lower degree of um, uh, elevation, that a SNP intronic to a, a transport enzyme but highly correlated to an um, amino acid altering polymorphism in the uh, or, um, organic ion, anion transporting polypeptide OTP1B1, which uh, as its primary function causes simvastatin to cross cellular membranes uh, and uh, is related to the uh, inactivation in, uh, of uh, these statins. Um, was highly associated with risk of uh, statin toxicity. If you look here, you can see that the odds ratios for um, this outcome are on average about uh, five-fold increased risk in, uh, for each copy of the C allele that has a minor allele frequency of 13%. Uh, that means there's not an insignificant number. It's about 1.5% who would be homozygous for this allele. Much of the risk would be concentrated in those who are homozygotes, and they have risks on the order of 8 to 10 fold uh, increased odds of uh, this outcome. The problem is it's a comparatively rare event, uh, this degree of muscle uh, intolerance. So currently it's not standard to measure this <coughs> genotype because it's relatively rare and we have routine screening uh, in patients who get exposed to this drug uh, with follow-up CPK uh, testing. Um, the estimate is that about 60% of the myopathy or the severe form of myopathy is attributable to uh, genetic variation at this locus. Uh, here, uh, 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 and this is a slightly different uh, population sample estimate of the frequency, uh, you can see the frequencies of the uh, different uh, genotypes. But you can see there's a big genotype difference. In fact, the CC genotype is the less common genotype. So there's, uh, not surprisingly, an FDA warning. Uh, many of your family members probably take simvastatin. Uh, it's widely prescribed. It's a generic statin that's very effective in lowering the risk of uh, adverse cardiovascular events. And in fact, the rates of muscle toxicity are not specifically higher with simvastatin than other drugs. Um, genotyping is currently not in clinical use. There are many alternative drugs with equal or better, better efficacy. So. Again, I'm highlighting that there are some examples where there are well-established genetic effects, but in fact, they don't translate into clinical uh, differences in approach.
Abacavir is a highly active antiretroviral therapy used to treat HIV. HIV, which used to be a lethal diagnosis, is now a chronic disease managed with multiple highly active antiviral agents uh, that are very specific for targeting key uh, mechanisms for HIV pathogenesis. Hypersensitivity, or uh, an allergic or anaphylactic response to uh, abacavir, uh, occurred in 5 to 8 percent of patients who started in the first six weeks. This is an outpatient therapy, and um, this led to um, uh, tight surveillance and monitoring for uh, this potentially life-threatening side effect. In a genome-wide association study, it was found that uh, a, um, HLA uh, allele antigen uh, or um, uh, polymorphism in the uh, an HLA antigen in the major histocompatibility uh, region was associated with substantially increased risk, and this motivated a randomized controlled trial of genotype-directed management. In the trial, 1,650 individuals were randomized to either upfront genotyping uh, and uh, administration of abacavir only to people who were, uh, who did not carry the risk genotype or standard of care, which was administering abacavir and then following for events. And in fact, you can see that clinically diagnosed hypersensitivity was uh, cut in half by uh, genotyping up front and uh, not giving the drug uh, to people who had the risk genotype uh, compared to the standard of care group. Uh, with a 3.4 percent absolute difference. That means you'd need to apply this therapy to 30 people to observe one patient who avoids hypersensitivity within six weeks. This is not an insignificant uh, impact. If you require uh, more precise confirmation of an immunologically confirmed hypersensitivity, because in fact clinical diagnosis is imperfect, you can see that immunologically confirmed <coughs> hypersensitivity was uh, dramatically reduced. Uh, and assuming that there's some noise in these estimates, and some of these are milder forms that uh, are not immunologically confirmed or might be less dangerous, uh, you can see it's roughly a 2.7 percent absolute risk reduction uh, of uh, severe hypersensitivity. So 94 percent of the population is at very low risk for this side effect, and uh, genotyping is therefore uh, recommended before uh, instituting a Bacavir uh, therapy, although there are now uh, a wide range of antiviral therapies that can be uh, used, so there are many alternates. Warfarin uh, is a drug that is used uh, to prevent thrombosis or exaggerated clotting. Clotting is a, um, a component of many uh, different diseases. Uh, that can present uh, with life-threatening uh, complications. Pulmonary embolus represents a clot that forms in blood vessels in the lower extremities and travels to the lungs and can cause the heart to uh, not be able to pump blood. Uh, myocardial infarction is another thrombotic event. And so anticoagulants, uh, atrial fibrillation is another uh, event that can lead to uh, strokes by clots forming in the heart. So there are many different reasons why patients might take systemic anticoagulants to try to reduce the risk of thrombosis. Warfarin was the standard of care uh, until recently. Uh, the Wisconsin Area Research Foundation uh, studied why cows were uh, having gastrointestinal hemorrhage when they ate sweet clover, and it turned out that a fungus on the uh, uh, grass that they were eating was producing uh, an anticoagulant. Warfarin or Coumadin uh, is that uh, anticoagulant. It's a pretty toxic drug. It has a very uh, narrow therapeutic window, uh, meaning that if you're inadequately thinned, uh, you have breakthrough thrombosis, and if you have too much blood thinning, uh, then you bleed. And this, you know, you shave yourself, you uh, bleed a little bit longer. Uh, that's just a nuisance. Uh, but life-threatening bleeding could be bleeding in the uh, gastrointestinal tract which experiences a lot of trauma from food uh, that passes through it, uh, or uh, the head uh, is not uh, common, but for people on warfarin, the risks are on the order of 0.1 to 0.3 percent per year for intracranial hemorrhage, which, because the brain is encased in a rigid skull, just a little bit of uh, extra volume in that skull leads to increased pressure that causes uh, a stroke and tissue destruction.
there was uh, known before the uh, reference sequence of the human genome was known, a polymorphism in another cytochrome P450 enzyme, CYP2C9, that had different alleles. They got these star notations because these were really detected from uh, RFLP analysis or uh, protein enzymatic activities, um, uh, not based on uh, knowledge of, uh, of nucleotide-specific genotype. And these had uh, reduced metabolism. This was known uh, uh, as of the late as of the 90s. Uh, a genome-wide association study of warfarin dose uh, identified a genetic variant in the vcore C1 gene. This gene encodes the vitamin K epoxide reductase uh, complex 1 uh, protein, uh, which was responsible for recycling vitamin K uh, and allowing uh, vitamin K to be uh, to participate in clotting factor activation. Vitamin K, if it's depleted, uh, leads to impaired clotting factor ac activation, which leads to inability to form clot. Common variation strongly influences the warfarin dose that's required. In fact, some patients require one milligram a day to have the same degree of anticoagulation as other patients who might require as much as 10 or 15 milligrams a day. So it has a very wide uh, range of dosing that's required to get patients therapeutic. Uh, and a common variant haplotype was associated uh, with warfarin dose. This effect uh, was demonstrated to be additive to CYP2C9 genotypes, so two independent genotypes influence risk. Uh, if you condition on having the wild type of this well-established uh, variant, you can see that there's a strong effect on the mean warfarin dose in milligrams per day, uh, such that the um, uh, uh, less common homozygotes uh, require an average 7 milligrams, and the more common homozygotes require 3 milligrams. This is a relatively strong effect for a complex trait. Um, and this was consistent across groups that had uh, variant uh, or wild type uh, CYP2C9. We don't really use wild type anymore for common polymorphisms. So uh, there was consideration of genotype directed warfarin dosing. Uh, you remember TPMT, uh, you have to genotype before you give. Uh, specific agents to treat leukemia, uh, would that be useful for predicting warfarin dose? And there, was, uh, there were several studies that incorporated age, sex, race, and medication use, uh, which are strong factors contributing to warfarin response, as well as the addition of genotypes at these two um, genes. And uh, they considered a comparison of genotype-guided warfarin dosing to standard of care, uh, and there were multiple trials that incorporated those. The general outcomes for these were time to therapeutic INR. INR is just a measure of uh, whether you're in that therapeutic uh, range of uh, thinness of your blood. Time in that target range, uh, meaning neither too thin nor too thick. Uh, and then uh, bleeding and clotting uh, outcomes and cost, but none of the studies were really uh, target or powered to be able to detect those. Um, so it was really, these were really powered to recognize time spent in the therapeutic range. And uh, in 2013, there were three papers published that basically showed an aggregate, no clinically relevant effect. Um, in one comparison of a clinical dosing algorithm versus a clinical plus genotype algorithm, uh, two independent studies showed no difference in the amount of time spent in the therapeutic range uh, for warfarin in the first 28 days or in the first 12 weeks. Obviously, after you've been on a drug for a while, with serial blood testing, we can tweak the dose and get people to a target. So this is really, uh, does the time it takes to get into that uh, therapeutic range uh, differ by genotype? And the answer was no, it didn't make a difference. Uh, there was one study that reported a slightly positive. It was. Uh, significant statistically, but probably not clinically significant, 7% difference in uh, time spent in this therapeutic range. And obviously, being within the therapeutic range doesn't mean uh, that you don't have a bleeding or clotting event. And being outside of this range for a short period of time doesn't mean you had a bleeding or clotting event. So. For a not clinically relevant, because your patient, if you're, if you're a patient taking warfarin, you don't really care specifically what a blood test tells you. You care whether you're going to have an adverse clinical event. Uh, these drugs, uh, these, these tests in aggregate were considered a failure 
and genotype-directed dosing is not currently indicated. Um, so there's probably no routine role, or probably no role for ut routine use of genotyping. And in fact, now there are alternative therapies that are on the market, uh, dabigatran, apixaban, uh, rivaroxaban, and there are additional uh, agents now available. Um, and in fact, these have a wider therapeutic window. Uh, they, uh, in general, allow fixed dosing because there's not so much variability in uh, dose required to have effective anticoagulation. And it's another example where by the time we figured out the answer of whether genotype was important to understand warfarin dosing, uh, warfarin was, uh, is largely now being supplanted by uh, these other novel uh, anticoagulants. So again, kind of a, uh, a recognition that while genetic variation does play a role in drug response and drug toxicity, we have to be quick to be able to recognize those effects in a time scale that's going to be meaningful to uh, application. So these are several examples that I've given you of how toxic effects can be uh, influenced by genetic factors. Um, as mentioned, 10% of all drug labels include pharmacogenetic effects, but understanding whether these are clinically relevant or whether they're clinically actionable or whether there are commercially available tests that allow one to uh, meaningfully impact care. This is uh, 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 only a minority of these. Okay. Lastly, I'll give you a few examples of some work we're doing. I'll take about just five minutes uh, on this subject just to give you a sense of what we're uh, studying. QT interval is a marker of uh, heart muscle repolarization. Uh, in every minute, your heart has to depolarize uh, to become electrically activated, contract 60 times, and it needs to relax 60 times uh, uh, to uh, allow it to be ready to be activated again. That relaxation, uh, electrical relaxation, is called repolarization, and when it gets prolonged, it can be associated with arrhythmias, uh, arrhythmias specifically due to abnormal electrical activity of the heart muscle that can cause sudden cardiac death. It's like epilepsy, but, uh, but of the heart, uh, epilepsy being abnormal electrical activity in the brain. Torsade de Pointe is uh, the, the hallmark uh, arrhythmia of QT prolongation. In fact, QT prolongation is associated with uh, 100 currently marketed therapies. Some get removed from the market after marketing because uh, we only recognize uh, this risk uh, once hundreds of thousands or millions of people have been exposed. Um, and some, for some, in fact, it's such a high risk that for patients who get started on uh, defetilide, the FDA uh, has mandated inpatient uh, starting to monitor the QT interval uh, to recognize risk. Many hospitals also admit patients to get started on sotolol. Um, QT interval prolongation, the average is about, uh, average QT interval is about 400 milliseconds. Prolongation by as little as 8 to 10 milliseconds is associated with increased risk of arrhythmias, but in fact, many people with this degree of prolongation experience no arrhythmias. It's, this is a probabilistic effect. There are Mendelian genetic syndromes that show strong familial aggregation of long QT. Uh, that's a, a frequency of about 1 in 2,500. Uh, short QT, much less common, uh, but both uh, involve uh, typically autosomal dominant inheritance of mutations in ion channels. Uh, these are highly penetrant, uh, although as we do larger studies uh, and extend to families, we recognize uh, there is some variability. Um, and these can be induced both by exercise or stress, uh, as well as QT prolonging drugs. So there are multiple genes that harbor rare mutations uh, associated with QT prolongation. And in fact, in some of these genes, there are uh, relatively low frequency polymorphisms that influence uh, QT interval. Here's a 10 millisecond uh, per minor allele effect for a 1% variant. Again, to calibrate your uh, understanding, this is in the range where the FDA would require elaborate studies for a drug if it were to have this type of effect. Um, this has been shown in a few studies and uh, it's been widely replicated now. In fact, that same variant turns up as a uh, risk factor for drug-induced torsade in the general population with a 8% frequency in cases compared to a 2% frequency in controls. Um, we've done 
uh, genome-wide association studies, small studies, uh, a small study of only a couple hundred uh, people sampled from the extremes of the QT interval distribution with successive waves of uh, replication identified a common variant that has a 3.5 millisecond per minor allele effect. This is a variant with a frequency of about 20 percent, um, but that means that between the alternate and homozygotes it's about a 7 millisecond difference. Um, and in fact, the same variant uh, is associated with increased risk of sudden death in um, families who have rare long QT syndrome mutations and um, is also associated with risk of drug-induced uh, arrhythmias uh, in unselected uh, populations not known to have uh, genetic mutations. We have done a large screen of QT interval as a quantitative continuous trait in 70,000 people uh, with replication in another 30,000 people and through that study identified uh, 68 common genetic variants uh, that are independent at 35 uh, loci, several of which have the Mendelian mutations that we already knew about. These explain about 10 percent of variability in QT interval, uh, which is about 40 percent heritable, so it explains about a quarter of the heritability of uh, this trait. Uh, we have combined these effects from an earlier GWAS and can demonstrate that comparing the top 20th percentile to the bottom 20th percentile of a uh, genotype score shows a, um, a potentially clinically significant big uh, difference in QT interval uh, duration and explains a substantial portion of variation in QT interval. When we expand to 68 SNPs, it explains more variance. And so we hypothesize that if long QT syndrome mutations are strong risk factors for drug-induced arrhythmias and a few common polymorphisms with relatively large effects increase risk that a, a genotype score of, uh, uh, of 70 common polymorphisms might lead to exaggerated QT response to medications and subsequent risk of arrhythmias. And we're testing this through a variety of studies including uh, bringing patients in based on uh, their uh, a 68 SNP genotype score. We're testing the score in different biobanks and then calling patients in and giving them a drug that causes a 10 millisecond uh, QT prolongation effect. On the scale of uh, there's no increased risk of arrhythmias at the one in a million range, so this drug is uh, as far as we can tell safe. We give a single dose, we do it in a monitored setting, uh, but we're testing whether this uh, genotype score influences QT response to this drug. We are um, drawing blood samples from patients who get started on Defetilide or Sotolol in the hospital. Uh, we're doing this now at seven hospitals uh, uh, nationwide uh, as part of a uh, consortium. Um, I will make a brief plug that we are, we do have a, a cardiovascular biorepository and many of these biorepositories include consent to be able to bring patients in uh, to do provocative testing such as drug administration as uh, we're doing. So what's needed to realize the promise of precision medicine, in this case in cardiology or for cardiovascular pharmacogenetics? Number one, we need to have accelerated discovery of pharmacogenetic effects. We really need routine collection of DNA in clinical trials. We need to establish the evidence base to support clinical implementation. I've given you some examples where the evidence base has not supported clinical implementation. We need to establish a medical system framework that can incorporate genetic risk we currently do not have that in place, and we need to educate clinicians. Uh, it's difficult for people who are actively engaged in the study of this uh, field uh, to interpret uh, appropriately the results that they obtain. It's that much harder for clinicians who are not uh, well versed in this. Thanks very much, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions as folks are filtering in for the next talk. <laughs>